Test. Is this on? Yeah, this is on. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick. I think I can hold this, yeah. My name is Nick. Um, we're going to talk about the road to a thousand contributors a month and beyond. This might not mean much to you, um, but to me, this was what they told me uh, this is your job. Um, all right. Uh, this is um, the goal for GitLab itself, so we'll explain it a little bit more in, uh, in detail. Um, but the bottom line, uh, what I wanted to share here, um, and it's, it's totally a conversation, I think, also with the audience, is what yeah, GitLab um, has learned uh, from Drupal, and what Drupal maybe can learn from GitLab. I'm not going to make any statements. I'm not going to say uh, you have to do it differently, as in you, it's also myself. I've been uh, a member of the Drupal community for over 15 years. Hi. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is by no means any um, uh, statement of saying, let's do everything differently. This is more knowledge sharing. Um, so that's a bit to set expectations in a sense. So as I explained, uh, my name is Nick. Um, at GitLab, uh, since April, I am the director of contributor success. Um, and I don't know how to explain that to the hairdresser, for example. Like I don't know how to explain what I do in a sense, um, but maybe to step back a little bit, I've been involved in open source ecosystems like Drupal for more than 15 years. Um, started uh, with DrupalCon Seged uh, a long, long time ago in that sense. Um, and I'm advocating open source in a sense that at GitLab, I'm working with the engineering team, working with the tooling at GitLab uh, to see how can we improve GitLab the product to cater towards the contributors for GitLab the product. Um, obviously, there are certain things that are in common with other open source ecosystems like the credit system of Drupal um, or maybe attribution in the git commit messages or maybe just some other kind of automations of uh, labeling and, and etc. Um, maybe you've heard uh, Neil say as well there's some things uh, in GitLab that maybe needs to change for Drupal or for the migration. Um, there is also certain communications that I'm doing with association uh, to see how can we improve that communication. Next to that, I'm also a member of the board of the Drupal Association, so I have some uh, connection still with both worlds in that sense. Um, so high level situation, um, open source is eating the world, and now we all cheer, yay! Uh, that's, that's, that's actually a good thing indeed. A step back in the past um, is that uh, software is eating the world. Um, you maybe heard that phrase in the past, uh, that software is eating the world, that any kind of industry um, is actually becoming a software industry. Um, maybe the best example that in today's world might be Tesla. Um, in the past, car factories had some software division. Now it's a software division that has some car, uh, a software company that has a car division, in a way. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about this and see how that uh, impacts uh, maybe our job, how that impacts these open source ecosystems um, and what kind of expectations we maybe can have uh, for the future. So this is also the situation. Uh, if all these companies are using software and then the next step is all these companies are using open source software um, and I don't have to ask you like are you using open source? We're at the DrupalCon. Uh, um, but there's still like there's a lot of companies that are now starting to use a lot of open source tools uh, to build their companies on. Um, if you don't maintain, and stating the obvious, eh, if you don't maintain these open source packages or whatever, basically you put your company at a risk because if the open source package breaks and nobody cares, then your business process is broken. Um, so organizations need open source to compete and those that leverage open source the best will win because they actually remove the risk for their business because they know those open source packages and they're actually able to maintain that or help maintain that. Um, again, and maybe it sounds obvious to you. Um, it's in my job at GitLab to talk to these customers and to say like, um, yes, uh, you're using GitLab, great. Um, but maybe if you contribute, you will actually gain a competitive advantage. Um, if you contribute full time, uh, it's actually in your best interest and in GitLab's best interest to do this together. Um, not a very easy conversation sometimes. This relates a bit to uh, a story that you might all know. Uh, who knows like Nokia and Blackberry? Uh, you all know, I would assume. Um, they're 
not really in today's world anymore. Um, now it's uh, Apple, Samsung, and, and those others. Who knows, cable, um, like, you know these digging machines um, that they, they create to make like holes in the ground um, that have cables? Have you ever seen such a digging machine? What, does, what do digging machines have today? They have pneumatics. Um, in the past, all of the digging machines had cables, and there was only one company that started with pneumatic um, digging machines, but they were like way more expensive. Um, but somehow, uh, all these cable digging machines said, you're crazy, this is too expensive, nobody's gonna buy it, we're sticking to the cable digging machines. Um, ultimately, today's world, we don't see the cable digging machines because if the cable snapped, actually a human could die and it's safer to use the pneumatic ones. But this is an example from the book, The Innovator's Dilemma. Um, today's example with software and open source is actually the same. Are we still actually going to see software that's closed in 10 years? Um, or is it open source? It's a dilemma. And for companies to invest in open source, it's still a little bit of a gamble in a way like, okay, let's go full in, uh, knowing that the future might be different. You don't know what the future is going to look like. If you'd like to read books, this Innovator's Dilemma is a great book to see how these big changes happen um, and who's on the forefront. And maybe another really good example on that, and then I'll, I'll move on, is do you know where Agile came from? Toyota. Um, in uh, the end of the 90s, there were three massive car factories, but they were not Toyota. Um, and then at 2009 or 2008, Toyota was the biggest one. Um, they had one massive competitive difference, and that's the way of working. Because for the rest, they were just car factories. Um, so who knows what the future will bring. This is interesting. This is um, something for what the future today is bringing. I don't know where it's going to head. Um, I created this with AI. This is the, the GitLab logo, the, um, yeah, the Tanuki, uh, with a Drupal bow tie. So differences and parallels, let's see. I'll do this a little quick. Um, so GitLab itself uh, started in 2014, um, had two co-founders, a Ukrainian uh, person and a Dutch person. Um, and as of the end of August, it has approximately 1,950 uh, team members. Um, it's called team members um, because GitLab itself also includes themselves in the community and then people that contribute to GitLab are, are called the wider community. Um, so we're being um, said, uh, don't say employees, it's team members, and we're all part of this uh, here. As of 30 million users, uh, and then the first commit was 2011, uh, and I think, um, yeah, has 3,600 contributors um, as of the 30th of August. Drupal, you all know, otherwise you wouldn't be here, uh, unless if anyone doesn't. Uh, it's a little weird if you don't. Um, but more companies that are contributing to okay, um, it has a broad adoption, a million sites, and started in 2001. So in a way, they have a lot of parallels, um, but there's also like a lot of differences uh, in that sense. And um, before I go into the, the contribution journey and like what what is maybe different in that sense, I'd like to give you some info over like about GitLab uh, as a company. Um, GitLab is fully remote, uh, so these close to 2,000 people don't have any HQ to go to. Everyone is at home uh, or in a co-working space, um, and it's it's a mission that everyone can contribute. So what does that mean? Um, we are de-incentivized to send private messages, and uh, everything that we open up in GitLab.org is actually public by default. Um, so that's uh, to make sure that you can actually also help us. Uh, or that we can help you, depends on how you look at it. Um, and this is the hardest thing that I had to get used to in the, the beginning when I started at GitLab, is that there's no email. Um, like this massive amount of people, and no, we don't email each other. Uh, I'm not sure if they monitor it, but you should not email it. And actually, I don't get a lot of emails from people. Uh, there's one other team member here from GitLab, um, but I'm pretty sure he also doesn't get personal emails from uh, yeah, team members. It's a very different way of working from what I was used to, um, but everything happens in GitLab issues and in Slack. And then uh, this is also what I mentioned in the bottom. Even on Slack, we are de-incentivized to send private messages. There's like a KPI on how many private messages are being sent, 
and that should reduce because otherwise people cannot help each other. Uh, so yeah, we need to be able to know what's everybody doing. Um, not to control, but to be able to help. Uh. How does an open source ecosystem work? Is there anyone here that ever tried to start a new open source project and then to try to like get contributors um, and, and get that bootstrapped and, and get that running? Um, or is doing that? I think Root is doing that. Uh, anyone else try that maybe in small scale or a large scale? But it's good, you try it and, and you so you also know like it's not so easy and there's like a lot of different factors coming into like how does that work. Eh? Um, I like to compare this a lot to, to youth work in, in a way. Uh, have you ever been in, in a scout? or scouts or any of those volunteer-based uh, systems when you were younger. Um, I was in the scouting um, or something along the scouts from I was 11 till 22. I started as uh, just playing around, uh, which is consuming uh, in a way, to then uh, starting to create games for the, the kids. Uh, I was like actually adding something to the, the system. And at certain point, I was responsible for all the teenagers. Um, I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, and it was all volunteer, um, but somehow I learned a lot of skills doing so. Um, those skills, in the end, benefited me when I was doing a job application and saying, I, I, I have some skills. Um, okay, I cannot compare open source to youth work in a way, but there are some, some parallels. Uh, it's all about people, people connections, uh, and trying to see how can we grow, because even a scouting needs to grow, otherwise it's uh, dying in that sense. So. Let's take a look at what it means to be in an open source ecosystem as an individual. Um, how many of you are um, organization owners or company owners or maybe founders or, or any of um, those? One, two, so a couple of you. Hang on, I have some slides for you as well in that sense, um, but it's a mix between individuals and organizations, obviously. Um, the Important thing as an individual, um, and maybe it's a question to you as well, like why are you in an open source ecosystem? Um, because everything is constantly changing um, and uh, it's a constant flow of actually new knowledge. Um, that's one thing, you come for uh, the, the software, somehow it changes um, and you keep getting all that new information, um, but it's constant and uh, it's, it's a great thing uh, in that sense. You can also see uh, the, the very elements that made open source so powerful, transparency, rapid iteration, collaborative innovation, uh, which is key for the individuals, are actually also something that um, is a kind of a, a protest against how companies were working in the past. Um, maybe today's world as well, that I don't know. Um, next to that, there's also incentive and rewards. Uh, the credit system of Drupal is a very good example on how far you can go towards incentivizing and rewarding um, and creating a system around that. Um, on GitHub, you could, for example, say uh, these badges that you can get on first uh, PR or, or any of those things. Um, there's a lot of those incentives and rewards. There's companies that uh, also maybe give away swag uh, when you create uh, a merge uh, request or have a merge request uh, merged. We'll get back to that. Uh, GitLab does some of that. Um, and then I think the uh, very important part of uh, a community, once you get started with the software, is the people. Um, so, as an organization, it's a very different explanation. Um, why would you, as an organization, um, one, yeah, adopt open source is quite easy, yeah, because uh, it's there, uh, it's good quality, um, and it actually brings you to market more quickly. But then the big question is, why would you contribute? Why would you give back to these open source packages as an organization? Um, I didn't invent these words here. Uh, so it helps and retain and attract top talent. Um, there is some research that happened um, that if, if indeed like you contribute back to software or you contribute to a certain ecosystem, uh, employees are actually also proud of the organization that they're working for. Um, maybe it makes sense like when I'm explaining it, um, but this is not so easy to uh, ultimately uh, get and then present to an organization owner or to a company owner and say like, this is actually an advantage for you if you let your employees contribute to open source. Um, the next one is actually also a very interesting one. This was um, a research that was done by Harvard um, by a professor called Frank Nagel. Um, feel free to, to Google it. I'm, I think I also have references on the, the slides later on. Um, that researched, 
if a company uses an open source package um, and you compare that to um, another company that uses that same open source package, so for example, agency A and agency B using Drupal, would there be a competitive advantage for the agency that actually contributes back to Drupal? Um, so this professor uh, researched this, and the answer is yes. And it's actually a fairly simple explanation why. Um, it's because if you uh, learn by doing it, you will learn a lot more than if you learn by just using or consuming. Um, it sounds simple, but uh, indeed, like if you just start doing it and go to the nitty gritty details of it and contribute back, you will learn a lot more about the system that you're using on a daily basis. Um, I think with Drupal, it's the same. Uh, agencies that contribute back to Drupal, they're probably, this is still uh, quote unquote, I don't have the research at hand for the Drupal specific uh, ecosystem, but we'll probably be more knowledgeable in actually using Drupal and getting a faster time to market for the same problem. Um, so I found that a really interesting research in that sense. Uh, people that are interested in that research, uh, please research Frank Nagel. He's like all in that kind of stuff. Um, and a lower, to lower, like lower total cost of ownership, it's kind of obvious. Um, if you push things upstream, you don't have to maintain it yourself your s like completely. Glue code or any other code that you have and you can share the maintenance cost, it's a lower total cost of ownership. Um, I wanted to remind uh, people here of a blog post that Dries wrote a couple of years ago um, about the privilege of free time. Um, Drupal went through um, a pretty big change from having contributors over the weekend to contributors over the week. I think uh, um, someone told me that it was also explained in the session before. Um, and it's maybe obvious, but um, it's a lot better for an open source ecosystem if people that are contributing are being paid for. Uh, because then at home, they can actually sit in their sofa or take care of the kids or do whatever they need to do in, in their uh yeah, the rest of their private life. Not everybody has free time. Um, if we want to be inclusive for uh, people that like are limited in that free time, we need to be able to create opportunities to make sure that they can contribute on paid time. So that also means that we need to uh, convince agency owners, company owners that contribution is key for that company to survive. Um, so hopefully you can help me in these conversations, uh, maybe to your business owner, to other people, but it's, it's good to uh, understand. So how does an open source ecosystem win? This is again an AI image uh, of a robot going to the finish line. Um, if you, this is completely side stuff. Eh? Um, I wrote down the prompt of what I wrote in the stable diffusion uh, API, or like it's a stable diffusion model. Um, you will not get the same image, but you will have something similar. Um, because yeah, the model just creates that image for you. I found it mind-blowing. So how does it win? Um, it actually goes from consumers to contributors. Uh, so uh, how can we make sure that uh, Drupal suddenly like doubles the amount of contributors? Would that be possible? And in the same sense, that's the goal that GitLab has. Uh, today, there's 120, 130 contributors a month. Um, and the goal is to go to 1,000. And that's a good question. How do we get there? How can we convert a lot of these consumers of, of GitLab into contributors? Um, I think the same question could be valid for Drupal, but it's also valid for Linux uh, and like other large ecosystems. Um, Drupal was very early to, um, I'm not sure if it the word is right, like invent, but the whole credit system as an incentive to make sure that people are being recognized for, but it's also an incentive to maybe try to get more of those. Um, but before we, we go there, um, and um, we need to understand like who we and what we're talking about. I thought when I started at GitLab, easy, I'm porting, I'm going to help Neil, I'm porting the credit system of Drupal into GitLab. Um, I was wrong. I was very wrong. Uh, I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, this is not so easy. Um, there's a lot of factors that we need to look at to understand like, what is a credit? What do we understand as a credit? Um, and what kind of contributions are there? That same Frank Nagel from Harvard also did a research on what does an, like, what's an open source contribution? Um, and he came up with these two words called content and editorial contributions. 
Content contributions means that if you come up with something out of thin air, uh, something new, uh, which could be new code or a new documentation page or something that you had to think about and uh, write down, um, that's a content contribution. Reviewing code or making a typo um, fixes or anything that's, um, I wouldn't say it's, it's less, it's at the same level, um, but where you don't create something out of thin air, that's an editorial contribution. Um, so uh, developing, reviewing, merging, reporting, commenting, reacting. The, the first one is a content contribution and the latter ones are editorial contributions. Um, I'm not saying that one is more important than the other one, eh? so don't quote me on that. Um, the you need all of them to succeed, um, but they have a difference and there needs to be a balance. Uh, if everybody is reviewing, merging, reporting, commenting, reacting, there's no innovation and then you, you get still. Uh, so you need all of them to, to survive. And then uh, you have people that have many hats. Uh, I've been an event organizer, I've been a speaker, I've been a developer, um, like other stuff. Everyone has different kind of hats. So how do you convert that into an ecosystem or into the product of GitLab? Um, that's not so easy. Um, what does one get in return? And then we'll get to the nitty gritty stuff of, of Drupal and, and GitLab and maybe some other ecosystems. Um, at GitLab, there's a couple of rewards you get if you contribute. Um, uh, there's a hackathon every three months. Um, and if you get a merge request merged during the period of the hackathon, you get a t-shirt or uh, a mug. Uh, someone's here in the room with a mug. I don't have a mug. I'm very jealous. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, she she fixed the typo. She got a mug, yeah, so that's kind of an incentive or reward to um, to do contributions. Um, if you do event organize like organization, if you do a merge request here and there, and you you start to um, yeah do a lot of quote unquote promotion for GitLab. You could be applying for a GitLab hero, and that means that you then can go to a summit or an event for all the heroes. This is not the same as a core contributor. Right? This is more your community evangelists, if, if you will, with some contributions. And then every month, uh, because GitLab has a monthly release cadence, um, there is uh, a nomination for the most valuable person of the month, um, which means in the release that's coming up, there's a contribution coming from someone and the we as a community deem that contribution really valuable. Um, so that's uh, one part. If we take a look at the rewards at Drupal, which I think it's interesting because it's wildly different. Um, top contributors get mentioned by project lead or I think also in the keynotes uh, from uh, earlier today, there were lists of names. Um, so you get recognition uh, for actually contributing to these large-scale initiatives. Um, but sometimes, and maybe tomorrow, I don't know, his keynote, there's a list of people that helped creating Drupal 10, or like there's a, a list of people that he mentions. Organizations get higher in a marketplace ranking based on the amount of contributions that you do. Um, if you want to know more about that, I think um, maybe Neil or the association can explain you a bit more. Um, but there's a, a specific ranking and it changes uh, compared to the amount of contributions you do to Drupal. And then both the individual, the organization and the client in Drupal can get attributed and recognized publicly. Um, you think uh, obvious, right? Um, in GitLab, it's only today, it's only the author of the code change of the merge request that gets recognized. Um, so there's no such thing as saying I'm doing this for a customer and I'm coming from company X. Um, that That's not the case. Uh, today, if I try to do that analysis, I need to guess based on maybe the profile information that you filled in or maybe the email address that you did it from. Um, but it's not so explicit. You didn't give explicit permission to actually show that to the world. Um, Maybe less measurable, we talked a little bit about that, uh, is you can jump the career ladder faster uh, and learn skills otherwise difficult in your daily routine. And I think I wanted to show you a really nice picture of myself. Well, actually, it was my wife that took this picture. Um, I went to Malaysia on a holiday, um, private holiday, um, but I couldn't resist the urge to meet the Drupal community in Malaysia. Um, like somehow I needed to do that. I wanted to do that. And I was explaining about search API and, and, and stuff. 
Um, so you get some fulfilling as well as a contributor uh, in, in open source. Uh, I needed to mask the, the faces uh, because legal told me so. Uh. So how are other open source projects attributing contributions? I think that's an interesting one. Have you ever looked at how WordPress um, attributes contributions? Or Typo3? Uh, Linux Foundation? Uh, that's interesting, right? Like for me, that was a new one. Like I knew the Drupal system, but if I wanted to get something in GitLab, it needed to cater for more ecosystems other than Drupal. Um, so let's take a look. Has anyone ever contributed to WordPress? So uh, you have a prop and you have a prop, right? Um, the, the word in, in the WordPress community is called prop. Um, and um, if people are working together and you get something in or there's something resolved, the people that are collaborating get a prop. A prop is something that is added to a git commit message. Um, and then the git commit match it message, you can see it here in the bottom, it might be a little unclear. It has a username, um, and the username links to the same username of profiles.wordpress.org. Um, and in your profile of WordPress, there's a link to an organization, and that's how they create these statistics that you can see on the right. Um, so then uh, you can see that there's 134 companies contributing to WordPress 6 and etc. So I found it interesting that they, they do that on a, a git commit level. Um, obviously, they recognize event organizations and, and all of that, but that's not within the git commit uh, sphere. Um, there are proposals uh, at WordPress to change the prop system to more git commit message default standards, um, and that's actually similar to what Linux does. Um, what Linux does, and maybe you need to take a look here at, at the bottom, is that in the git, commis uh, git commit message themselves, they add, um, yeah, suggested by, suggested by, signed off by, authored by, reviewed by, uh, acknowledged by, um, and then has like a bunch of email addresses. Um, so that allows you to create a distinction between content contributions and editorial contributions, because you know who created it and who helped. Um, there's no difference in importance, um, but at least like there's some information on the balance of what's going on while attributing and recognizing the people that collaborated. Um, so I found this really interesting. And how do they link it to organizations? They look at the email address. Um, if and then you could question like, hmm, but I'm a volunteer at home, and during the day I'm working for a company. Well, it's quite easy. You switch email addresses in the the Git commit that you do, uh, because based on that email address, it actually links to the organization. I found that really interesting. Um, if we take a look at Drupal, and I think you all know uh, this. There's a whole like credit system, um, and then in a secondary basis, there's some git commit um, that does a summary of those, but there's no such thing as like authored by or reviewed by or, or that. Um, so that could also be interesting. Um, that said, Drupal obviously goes in a higher level and recognizes contributions other than git commits themselves as well. Um, so then I got in a, like a little bit of um, a conflict with myself, like, okay, uh, how should we go forward? Do we go with the Git um, flow and going just to get commit messages? Or do we have an overarching system? I'm still not sure. I'm happy to get some more feedback, I think, from the audience there. Um, but today, um, this is my dashboard. Uh, so today, we are recognizing the author of a merge request, and we're looking at how many authors of merge requests do we have every month. Um, and you can see there in August, it's the green bar. It was like 126. Um, and we look at how many merge requests are created, how many are merged. Um, so there's like a big start and ending point. Uh, and there's like a lot of opinions in between. So what draws contributors to, to GitLab? Um, and then maybe um, we can go in Q&A uh, a little bit later to see if there's like thoughts and suggestions. Um, and I have like a little roadmap as well of like where we're working on uh, at GitLab. So what draws contributors to GitLab? Um, there's events, so these hackathons, there's meetups, also virtual meetups. There's community office hours, GitLab commits, and here it's summits. What you don't see here, um, and what I think is a concept that you all know, is sprints. Um, 
like I was a bit surprised that there were no such thing as sprints uh, in the GitLab community, um, physical or remote. Like I, I'm not sure if I've ever done a, a virtual or remote sprint, but probably is possible. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if we could maybe start that or have any uh, of that uh, starting. Uh, but this is what uh, is happening today to uh, get contributors. Now, in terms of metrics and, and learning, and this might also be interesting. Uh, so the hackathon, um, which is a very different word than a sprint. Uh, so a sprint is working on maybe long-term things. Hackathon is like get as many people as possible for as small anatomic uh, changes as possible. Um, and if you have something merged in hackathon, you get the prize. Um, uh, you can see at the right in August, there's like a massive spike. Um, that was the hackathon. You can actually also see um, that here in May, there was also a hackathon. And then in February, there was also a hackathon. So every time there's a hackathon, um, it's a peak. And then it actually decreases because people are waiting for the next hackathon um, because they don't get prices in the two months that's our following. That's a problem. Um, like, we actually want to keep them. Uh, like, please continue and like don't wait for the price window to open up. Um, so we're going to see if we can maybe change the uh, expectations there in that sense. Um, what we also saw, and we did some analysis on the data, is that as soon as people have 10 contributions, they're more likely to stay. Um, that sounds obvious, but I was actually expecting like four or five. Uh, like if, they, if you do four or five merge requests, maybe you will stay. But it's actually like you need 10, um, and then you're more likely to stay. Uh, it's really easy under 10 to actually drop and never come back. I'm curious if we could figure out that data for Drupal as well. Um, but that's that's rather difficult, um, I think. Future initiatives, um, and this is also, I think, interesting for, for Drupal, although it's not so easy to accomplish. Um, if we have people or organizations that have 20 merge requests or more in the last three months, um, merge request merged, uh, they get entitled to a specific badge. They're called a leading organization or a leading contributor in a way. Um, and if they have that status, um, we promise or we have an objective uh, because it's not an agreement, it's an objective, an SLO, um, that we get back to them within four working days. If they say, I'm ready, um, please review this. Um, the review could be, oh, you didn't add description. So anything that just says, okay, what's the next step? Um, that's what we are trying to do within those four working days. Um, I know in, in the Drupal world, by my own experience, sometimes issues can linger around for a long time. Um, for years, uh, um, it's a good and a bad thing, like everyone is equal, that's very good. Um, but it would be nice that if we somehow have people that says, okay, let's try to shorten that time to maybe increase the innovation or increase the change pace. Um, this is an experiment that we're doing. It could be that in two months I do the same presentation and this no longer exists. Uh, so uh, you can find this back in the handbook uh, on like how you qualify and uh, that. An organization, like even if you have an organization and five people do a merge request, um, they could still qualify if those five people do four merge requests each. Uh, so it's an organization that qualifies as a whole. Um, and foster communication, there's like a lot of communication channels uh, at GitLab uh, for contributors. I would love to get to that same centralization that uh, Drupal has. Um, but again, like that's also not super easy to, to do. Um, and maybe as, as a last thing, the contribution credits in uh, system in, in GitLab. So this is a bit of the timeline. I think Neil can confirm that's more or less the timeline. Uh, and um, you can maybe also understand now that looking at these other ecosystems, just porting the Drupal um, credit system into GitLab was not so easy. Um, or it, it couldn't be just like plug and play and, and create like a mini form and just see, okay, let's, let's go for that. There was not enough consensus um, to cater to these other open source ecosystems as well. So I became responsible for the uh, issue uh, in the end of June. Um, which is, is good, so then uh, it, it actually says you are the directly responsible individual. That doesn't mean you have to execute it, but you can make decisions, uh, but you have to listen to everybody and then maybe make another decision later on, but at least um, there is someone responsible. 
Um, we are now working on the developer certificate of origin, uh, which means that uh, you get that mini message in the git commit uh, yeah, message that says signed off by. So it's a very small step to just a git commit message thing itself. I would love to get reviewed by, I would love to get um, collaborated with, or something like, like that line, just within the git space. Maybe later, in the other iteration, um, we could go more holistic and look at the issues. Um, but again, like I don't know um, how fast we can get there. There's a couple of, of links here, um, but these are user stories that are open in uh, the, the issue queue um, of what needs to happen to get this um, reviewed by and get this um, yeah, signed off by uh, with multiple email addresses uh, like to get in production. It's like a very small scope, just having reviewed by, assigned by, um, yeah, all of those things with multiple email addresses, and this is like that work that needs to happen. Um, so you can see, like, to port the credit system of Drupal into GitLab, we're still like still uh, a little bit behind, or uh, it's like a long way to go. Eh? So I have to get in touch with um, GitLab. Maybe you can help me um, if you make a merge request and it gets merged. You get gifts. Eh? Uh, I have socks as well. If someone wants to port the system right now. Um, we have community resources, it's how to contribute. Uh, there's a handbook page, uh, you can join the community at Gitter, um, and then there's also an unofficial Discord space where you can uh, yeah, talk and, and uh, hang out. There's a community relations team, and then there's uh, my team called Contributor Success, uh, so uh, in charge of that engineering process um, and to see like how can we cultivate and grow to that thousand. And then there's also, similar to Drupal, a core team, uh, so core contributors that are not necessarily working at GitLab, uh, and there's uh, some that are working at GitLab. And coaches. This is, I think, also really interesting for Drupal. There's 35 merge request coaches, and their job is to help you find the right person. Uh, you make a merge request, and their job is to see who do you need to get in touch with to make this move forward. Um, are the labels correct? Um, I think this is similar to mentors in the Drupal space, although it might be different. I don't know enough about the mentors, so I'd love to understand a bit more. Um, but yeah, this is what uh, they have. And with that, I'd love to thank you uh, for your attention. Hopefully you found it interesting. And uh, maybe there's some questions. I don't have the app. So if someone can read the questions, if someone puts questions in the app, I'd be happy, or I'll be happy to take live questions as well. Hello, does it yep. work? It seems to work. Any questions? Um, do you know that Drupal is changing how um, the credit system works because it's migrating to GitLab partially? And there are some things that are being lost, like for example, the uh, some parts of the credit system. Um, and I would like to know if you have an opinion on on this on this change. Well, which change? I'm sorry. I mean, uh, Drupal Drupal org is using GitLab as the Git uh, backend, and they are moving a lot of things to GitLab. Part of the change involves changing the current credit system, and for example, the commits have been removed from the profile in Drupal.org and they are based on, the, they're going to base that information on GitLab. Uh, so I, I would like to know if you know the changes and what's your opinion on that? I'm not super involved, Neil is more involved. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to give him a microphone, but in his keynote initiative, he actually said mm -hmm. like they're porting the system to another system in Drupal, from what I understand, but there is no functional or like scope mm -hmm. change. Um, but there's also not being embedded in GitLab. But do you like to like add on to that more, or is that accurate, yeah, what I said? That's, that's great. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I didn't expect to, it to be added to GitLab quickly, no matter how right. you were. So. Yeah. Uh, but if it does seep over to GitLab, you would have to add it to it. Yeah. So for the next iteration of Drupal.org, even with the GitLab migration, it, the functionality is going to stay. Okay. Right. 
Yeah. I'm kind of curious on the um, on the metrics that uh, that that of your open source contributors. So, f for me, what made me start in open source is scratch my own itch. I wanted to build a website, so I, I installed Drupal. Drupal had multiple problems, so I started fixing them, and then I gave them back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, as a GitLab user, I don't have that. First of all, it's a pretty good product already. I do have some itches that I need to scratch here and there, but getting to ten, I mean, that's 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 like. I, I, what are those people doing with Drupal, uh, with uh, GitLab? I, <laughs> yeah, I, I simply can't imagine having 10 problems. So you're saying the, fin the product is finished, like, just get out of here, it's fine? <laughs> yeah, so I, I get your question. I, I get it asked like a couple of times, but if you would ask the CEO, um, he says we're only 15% there. Um, for example, like the, there's a whole Kubernetes agent uh, now, and there's like uh, a lot of these other uh, toolings, uh, the clusters and, and whatnot, that are constantly changing and updating features, uh, making management more easy. Um, so all of that also needs to happen. Like the, the whole maintenance part also still needs to happen. Um, and then there's a bunch of new functionality that is open for discussion, like even this credit system that needs to be added in. For example, Yep, thanks. Um, uh, one person said, um, I like it, these issues, and I have merge requests, and now uh, GitLab also added a support ticketing system. Bare bones, but it's there. Um, but I don't know which customer it is, and I also don't know what the rate is for that customer if I uh, answer the support ticket. So this is a core contributor that says, well, let's add a CRM system. Bare bones, but let's add who is a customer and what organization is this person working for. Um, and that's a contribution that he did in multiple iterations, but I'm very grateful of that because now in the database there is actually uh, the thing called organization, and that might be useful for the credit system at some point. Maybe not. We still need to investigate, uh, but that's one one alley. Um, but there are many people scratching itches on, on GitLab. Uh, I think. 2,500 merge requests open right now and like 50,000 issues or something, I don't know. Uh. Um, I have a question about the, um, why are the only the authors of the code credited? Well, first of all, there can be several authors of the code, obviously. Um, but I've, I've seen looking at the statistics for the GitLab credits that a model maintainer who merges lots of patches from other contributors in, doesn't get any credits for that. So it's like making that part really invisible, even so we know that reviewing merge requests or patches or other issues take a hell of a long time. What do you mean with module maintainers within the scope of GitLab? Uh, um, when you look on the, when you used to look on the project page on, on Drupal.org, for example, um, the activity included accepting merge requests or accepting patches. I mean, you could look on GitLab, I understand that the action of merging something is not credited. Or did I get that wrong? I think there's maybe a confusion, like what I'm um, explaining is for GitLab, the project on GitLab.com. Ah. Um, so I'm not talking about uh, any of the credit system of the, the GitLab implementation of Drupal. Um, yeah. The GitLab implementation of Drupal normally should take whatever existed in terms of credits um, and and be feature parity in that sense. If there's any lacking thing there, I would suggest that you talk to maybe Neil or, or other people uh, to see like wha what's going on there. Um, maybe to understand like why does GitLab, the project on GitLab.com only credits authors, is because that was the easiest thing to start with. Um, I'd love to get more complex, um, but one of the values of GitLab is iteration, and that's how we started. And then it's a good question like what's next? What's the smallest next possible change we can make? Does that answer your question? Thanks. I think time's up. Uh, I see like a moon rising there in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for attending. I'd love to like answer more questions later on if you'd like. Uh, maybe one other thing. There is a Belgian night tonight at 9 p.m. Uh, and it's on the DrupalCon website at social events. Uh, uh, yes, and swag, there's t-shirts there. Uh, those that actually um, made some questions, please come to the front and you can take a t-shirt or, if you're really quick, socks. <laughs>